Good morning and welcome to our next session looking at um, AD mapping. Um, I think it's a given now that we know that good quality CPR and early intervention with an AED mm. saves lives. What we're going to look at this morning are three separate presentations of how we can ensure that that AED is available to our patient. The AED is of no use if it stays in its nice, shiny, heated, locked cabinet on the wall. We do need to find ways and better ways to get them to our patient. So first off, I'm going to hand over to Fabrice. Um, and he, I'm going to allow him to introduce his own session of looking at how we improve that access. Well, hello everyone. Thank you, Inie, for the invitation. I'm Fabrice. I'm a medical doctor in Switzerland. Um, I must admit, unfortunately, I have no conflict of interest. Uh, I will talk uh, today about early defibrillation. So you know the slide uh, by heart, but you see that the defibrillation is in the center of the, all the work we have to do to try to make people survive. I like this one too. Uh, from Asia, different color, different style, but the idea is still the same everywhere in the world. Many things to do, included uh, defibrillation. But this is my most favorite one because on this one, you can see the close work that bystander and dispatcher have to do together uh, to work to make uh, people survive. What do they have to do? Well, on this picture, you can see the survival curve that uh, the more time pass, the less people will survive, of course. And you have this bystander windows, uh, which we can also call dispatchers, bystander or dispatchers windows. That's a time, 7, 10, 15 minutes, where dispatcher and bystander can do something to make people survive. Honestly, that's the most of the work. It's usually not the ambulance or the physician that save people without uh, hospital cardiac arrest, but it's what they will do during those 10 and 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So first, what they have to do is, uh, of course, telephone CPR. You're probably familiar with that. But there are some barriers for that. Uh, first, you have to train your dispatcher. Not all dispatchers are comfortable with that. They have to recognize agonal breathing, and that's quite difficult for some of them. And they have to use the motto, no, no, go, that was invented, I believe, in Seattle. No conscious, no breathing. That means it's a go for TCPR. And if you apply that correctly, and Seattle does it very well, you can have even 50% false positive. That means in Seattle, half of the time, they, risk, they perform CPR on people that are not on cardi in cardiac arrest. But that means they almost don't miss anymore any cardiac arrest. Then dispatch, of course, have to measure the performance time from um, uh, receiving the phone and recognizing cardiac arrest time from recognizing cardiac arrest and star CPR. If with this data, we have to collect all those data to know how good we are or how bad we are and compare with others and then improve uh, what we're doing. Uh, unfortunately, on TCPR again, what we know from at least 2015, that's in the US at least only 50% of PSAP performed TCPR at that time. It wasn't even better in Europe. I don't know the number today, but there is still room for improvement. Now, AEDs. Um, AEDs have program have barriers too, that's for sure. I will not talk today about politics or finance on AED program because that's a whole topic. We could talk about that for half a day. I will just underline some operational issues. Um, AEDs can be misplaced, and that's the main point of my topic you will see. They may be unavailable, it's been mentioned, locked in a room, in the bus room, in whatever. Badly signposted, that happens too. Uh, not registered within your dispatch, that happens quite often. I realize that every month in my state. Um, there are places where there may be a lack of AED, and we'll see how we can, we can measure that. Uh, you have to train your dispatcher to use this AED program, because they have to recognize, the, of course, the cardiac arrest, but then while sending an ambulance, they have to send a dispatcher to get the uh, bystander to get the AED. So it's quite a training. And 
for this to work, you need at least two bystanders. That's a limit sometimes, because sometimes you only have one bystander, and you use it for TCPR, and you cannot send him or her to get an AED if it's too far. It's been it's mentioned before by Dr. Laribo uh, and his team. The survival rate globally of heart hospital cardiac arrest is barely 10%. It hasn't changed much during the last 10, 15 years. But what we know now with AD, it's a new data, well, a couple of years, but not. Uh, uh, we, we don't use it as often as probably we should do. So there is a great potential if we can use it more than what we do now, around 5% of out of hospital cardiac arrest benefit from an AED. And that's really low. So if you have the willingness to build an AD program, and probably most of you already have one, that's something question you should ask yourself. Uh, first, the incidence of sudden cardiac arrest over time, but in your setting. Because it's not exactly the same if it's urban, rural, uh, business, airport. Uh, also, you have to know the density of your population. You will not put an AED the same way in an urban setting than a rural setting. Uh, you have to know the specifics of your uh, region, if there are dangerous activities, if there is a huge airport. We know from the 80s that AEDs in big airports are really beneficial. beneficial. Uh, you have to know if you start your AED program, if there are already AEDs in buildings, and it's quite difficult to know to ask people to let you know that they have one. Uh, you have to know if it's a private one or a public one, because you won't be able to play uh, with a private one. If they have one, they want to keep it, but you won't be able to move it, even if you tell them it's not the right place to have one. While a public one, you, it will be easy for you to move it, and we'll see that uh, with the map. You have to know if it's available 24-7, of course, uh, AD in closed building at night, don't send a bystander to get it. And of course, if you have the opportunity to have police or fire vehicle to, with AEDs on board, I think many uh, communities have that. That's a great value because they are, they are often the first one on site with an AED. So we study in our state, we want to know what was the coverage of our out of hospital cardiac arrest with the AEDs. And we wanted to know if some should be added. This is a classical question. But also, it's not that classical, if some should be displaced for, once again, to have more efficiency, to use those AEDs where they're really needed. So um, how does our hospital cardiac arrest are not, uh, is not a random distribution. There are clusters. And you have to find out where those clusters are. They are always the same through time. So there are some, what we call in our study, hotspots, where you are pretty sure that once a year, once every two years, you will have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So we considered in this work that a out-of-hospital cardiac arrest within 100 meters ra radius of an AD is considered as covered by the, your system, by your AD program. So we took all our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest for four years, retrospectively, we took all the location of our AEDs, known at that time, and we analyzed with the geo software the distances from out of hospital cardiac arrest and AED. Hotspots, we define that as five or more out of hospital cardiac arrest within 100 meters radius that were not covered by an AED, which means we should need, we should put a new AED on that hotspot. But also, we looked at if there were too many AEDs, which means AEDs, two AEDs within 100 meters, probably that is not efficient. And to explain that, the map will be a lot easier. You will understand finally what I'm saying. You have on, the, on this map, it's a part of a city. All the red spots are out of hospital cardiac arrests on four years. You have black heart. Black heart were AEDs in place at the time of the study. What we found on this map, that there were three hotspots not covered where we should place one AED, the green one, because there were five, at least five out of hospital cardiac arrest not covered within 100 radius meters. So that was 
our decision to 200 meters radius, I don't believe there is a national recommendation or international recommendation. But we, with this work, we found out where to place a couple more AEDs, and there were 20 we should place at, that at the time of the study in our state. And on the other hand, we looked at where this place, for example, have too many AEDs. Seven AEDs, not that many out of hospital cardiac arrest during four years, and they were too close for each other, though. If those AEDs are public, you can take number one, number two away, and use them somewhere else to bring more efficiency to your system. So, if you want to have to be efficient with your material, with your AEDs, use a geo software to find out where they are really needed. Some should be added, AEDs, some should be displaced. And of course, your uh, dispatch program should uh, work closely with the app for first responder, which it's been uh, mentioned before, and the app with AED. Sometimes it's the same app, but those two tools have to be uh, working together. Okay, that's it for me, and uh, I'm available for any question if there are any. I don't remember the name, I think it's on the slide, but uh, you can ask me after that. Uh, we It's going to be a great pleasure to introduce colleague David Fredman from um, Heartrunner, Sweden. Um, we shared this floor five years ago, I believe, when we first debated this. It would be really interesting to see how things have moved on. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, just gonna, we, we tested this previously, and everything worked out really fine. Uh, yay, again. Thank you very much for having me uh, again. Well organized, Ina. So I'm really proud to be in this uh, in this session. My name is David. Uh, I'm a, I'm a PhD and operations manager of Heartrunner Sweden. There is a, a bit of an error in in the program. I will be talking about AD mapping and volunteer response, uh, how to increase AD use and the earlier dispatch can make uh, make this even better. I have some conflict of interest. I'm a member of the Inatec and Ops Committee. I'm also a member of the Swedish Research Station Council. I'm a co-founder of the Heart on a Sweden system. If we were in the flight security business, they would lock the doors and not let us leave if uh, the death tolls were the same as it is uh, when it comes to cardiac arrest. Over 340,000 people die from cardiac arrest every year in Europe. It happens slowly. It happens everywhere, so we really don't see it. The dramatic ones appear in public. Everyone remembers uh, Christian Eriksson in the UEFA game a few years ago. Up to 80% of them actually occur in public homes. That, that, that's where the majority is. Uh, majority is also male, and as we heard, survival is 10% on an international level. There might be some differences in like local regions, uh, cities, uh, but on an on a international level, it's 10%. But it should be kind of easy to push those numbers. And we've seen this one, the chain of survival. It's been implemented since the 90s. Each link is dependent on the other, uh, and everything is sort of great. But this one, we've seen it before. 100% of the cardiac rest out of hospital, they are a 112 call. But only 48%, and this was, if I remember it right, it was 50,000 cases of cardiac arrest. Only 48% actually received bystander CPR while waiting for the ambulance. And only 11% were defibrillated by an AD in public locations. So that's the problem. Everyone's calling 112, and then things sort of go south from there. 
So the rationale for AD mapping, which is the, the cover, uh, the, the topic for this session, make the installation of publicly available ADs known. You bought something, you want it to be used, put it on a map. To increase AD use and ultimately increase survival. That's the whole idea, isn't it? Otherwise, buy it, don't put it on a map, or maybe don't even buy it. Show your assets. And the rationale for citizen responders, like alerting them through smartphones or text messages. Again, early uh, CPR and AD use uh, may double or triple survival in cardiac arrest. And why not let motivated people uh, who are trained in CPR actually use the skills? Because uh, most people never get to use the knowledge that they gain from a CPR course. I, I, if I ask you, how many here knows how to do CPR? Hands up. Everyone. How many have done it when you're not at work? Yeah. It's a great crowd. So this is the thing. You know something, but you don't get to use it. European Resuscitation Council actually uh, endorsed implementation of citizen responder systems. Uh, and they, they are known to increase both CPR and AD use. Uh, in Sweden, uh, bystander CPR increased by 30% when volunteer responders were first. In Denmark and Copenhagen, uh, bystander defibrillation was tripled from dramatic 7% into something like superhuman 21%. Um, and serious responders uh, in Sweden actually, they mandate for 40% of the, of the early interventions in cardiac arrests when they are alerted by a smartphone system. So this is really making a difference. Bystander defibrillation and CPR increased when one or more volunteer were on scene. So, it, yeah, it takes more than one, but even one changes the game. And significantly increased bystander defibrillation even in patients' home. This is a group of patients that traditionally has not been targeted by early interventions. But if you alert them by smartphones and ask them to bring in AD, things can change. So, AD mapping, citizen responders, great match. Some key factors for, for AD mapping and citizen responders is proximity, availability, and density. You need to be close. You need to be well, available so I can actually do something. And there is a density thing. How many volunteers? How many ADs? Is it, do we need the more the better? No, nah, I don't think so. Citizen, citizen responders in Sweden, they saw a sweet spot. If you're closer than 1,300 meters, you will beat the ambulance and provide early CPR and AD use. I'm sure that it could be longer, depending on, on the settings in your region. 60% of the ADs in Denmark are available 24-7. Bystander defibrillation tripled, and 30-day survival nearly doubled when the nearest AD was available compared to unavailable. So if you rely on AD mapping, availability really changes things. In, in Sweden, 20% of the ADs in the National AD Registry is available 24-7. I'm not sure how it looks in, in what's it in Switzerland? Uh, it depends on the region, but in the city it's probably 40%. Yeah. Things really need to change. Uh, put them outside, heated cabinets, uh, I think it's really valuable. This is a, a movie showing AD availability on the, on the orange graph and proximity to cardiac arrest on the blue graph. When, the, when this movie stops, you will see that the, the blue lines, the, the less ADs that are available, the longer the distance to the nearest AD is. And people tend to have cardiac arrests all over, so it's not limited to office hours. But AD availability is limited to office hours. Look what happens in the weekend. People are free. So they close the office, and all of a sudden we have a bigger problem with AD availability. In Netherlands, a uh, researcher analyzed uh, density of ADs and citizen responders in relation to, to time to first shock. And like we see from Fabrice, two ADs per square kilometers and maybe five to 10 uh, citizen responders per square kilometer, actually uh, that benefits the use. So we need to know where to put them, and we need to have a a fair amount of them. So again, AD mapping and citizen responders, that's good things. So is everything cool and great? 
What do you think? It is proven that, that volunteers can greatly impact outcome in cardiac arrest. Uh, and proximity and uh, that sort of grants that, that you get to use ADs or, or perform CPR. But any delay in, in the PSAP actually limits the success. This was the, uh, the subject for a uh, research project from Karolinska Institute with the aim to measure three different response time intervals and to compare emergency medical systems, firefighters, and smartphone alerted volunteers, looking at, at three different time intervals, uh, 2,600 cardiac arrests. Time to dispatch, that from 112 call until you alert the first uh, uh, unit, and the unit response time for how long it takes from when you were dispatched until you arrive at the patient, and then the total response time. And we look at time to dispatch. The gray graph that shows the, that EMS, the ambulances, they are alerted early. And there is a delay for volunteer responders. The blue ones, the, the top one, they are also alerted to, to bypass an AD. So there is a delay here. And when you look at the unit response time, you see that the ambulance, they need to travel quite a while. So even though the dispatch time is really fast, the unit response time is the longest, 8.3 minutes compared to 4.6 minutes if you just alert a volunteer to go to perform CPR. But when you look at the total response time, volunteers trying to run there, they're actually beaten by the ambulance. Uh, the time differences are limited, uh, uh, eliminated since there is a delay at the PSAP. They wait for too long to dispatch the volunteers so they cannot really beat the ambulance. Volunteer responders arriving first on scene had the shortest unit response time when compared to firefighters and EMS, but the advanced, uh, advantage was reduced by delays introduced at the PSAP. So this is something that we really need to change and have 112 call takers and dispatchers actually work uh, to change this. I'm going to give you some take-home messages. Create a robust system for AD mapping. It should be easy. Maybe not too easy, but it should be really easy to enter your ADs in it. And vouch for 24-7 availability, because it is crucial. And establish routines to actually ensure that functionality could be maintained over time, because this is also something that, that actually really needs to change. Make, sure, make use of the motivated volunteer responders, because they, they, they can actually use the ADs. And make sure that the PSAP make the most of all these resources and that they do it fast and without any delay. And if any questions, I'm happy to answer them here. Yeah. Great. Um, did you fix criteria to recruit the volunteer responders by a training, by refresh training, and so on? Um, yeah. Uh, in, in this, uh, well, the system that I represent now, it's, that's available in Sweden and in Denmark, there has not been any uh, outreach uh, per se. We kind of rely on, on other organizations training people and then motivating them to join. Okay, so there are no standardized criteria to, as a volunteer uh, to integrate the systems, no minimum requirements. Uh, you so need on. to be over 18 and know how to do CPR. That's, that's about it. This, this is really citizen responders, not lay responders or yeah. trained, educated, equipped, no. Thank you. Some, it really depends on the city and the region. The rules may be different. Uh, in, in our place, people need to be either a health professional or have a BLS course. And what I know from the US, typically in the US, they don't allow uh, those first responders to go in private home because they're afraid that they may steal things. Uh, in our system, we don't engage them for a cardiac arrest from a trauma because we are afraid yeah. that they may be too shocked to see too much blood, etc. Yeah. So the criteria may be different depending yeah. on the system. The city. Yeah. It's the same thing that, that we use in Sweden and in Denmark where the safety foundation is, is maintaining it. They don't alert uh, to trauma, uh, obvious suicides, unfit locations, and, and small children since it might be something else than you actually sign up for. Is there a standard or minimum data set for recording AD, AD locations? Could you repeat it again? Sorry. Yeah. Is there a standardized or at least a minimum set of data of information that you use to record ADs? You mentioned it is supposed to be easy. Yeah. Uh, 
the data here is that that's from the Swedish National ID Registry, where all, what you actually have is uh, GPS coordinates, address, access hours, and owner. That that's the the baseline. And I think it's a similar baseline as in Denmark, which we've been looking at since the Danish ID Registry was implemented uh, a, few, a while earlier. But I think that that could be easy. But I was also talking to Fabrice. Maybe this is something where we need to create like Utsting credentials for. AD mapping, what should be in it? What could we leave out? What's necessary, what's sort of good to have? Thank you. We've been talking a lot about mapping and uh, there might be a fragmentation in the databases. You're talking about the National Registry, which is of course countrywide, which is a good thing. Have you ever compared it to an open database? OpenStreetMap is what I'm thinking about. No, but I think there will going to happen things. I know that the Google Map team are a bit reluctant on, on putting like this uh, life, well, potentially life-saving uh, information on their maps and then maybe sort of uh, need to grant the uh, reliability. But uh, it could be implemented on any, I, I guess it's just a simple uh, geo database. It is. Um, would love to talk to you later. Come sure. to Rescue Track. Um, we have experience with it. Great. I'll see you. Cool. I'll be here. Thank you very much. I now take great pleasure in introducing um, Gabor from Hungary and Sofia from Austria to look at some of the challenges that they've experienced in having an international available AED database. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, actually, I'm here to uh, make a dream come true. Uh, as far as I know, Mr. Pyrrhus had a dream. Uh, in the last conference that uh, he would like to know where are the AEDs. Now, uh, I, can, I can show you that uh, 4 million people knows where are they. Um, I'm quite sure that uh, uh, we are so confident that we need to have an AED map, we need to have AEDs, but we don't know where are they. Uh, in four countries, uh, together, nearly 4 million uh, people knows where are the nearest uh, AED to, to them. We interconnect uh, for countries, uh, for applications, uh, they use this definitely the same uh, uh, interface and definitely the same user inter, uh, experience. Uh, that's a cross-border functionality. It's a homogeneous uh, uh, application for all of us. For example, in Hungary, we use the Lifesaver application. In Hungarian, we say Elatmentu uh, application. As you can see, the color is different, but I can use my application in Austria, Slovakia, or in Czech Republic the application automatically switch, um, switches uh, next to the border, and I can use it in my language, in a native language, in, uh, in that application. So uh, the language is not an issue. If you like to call uh, uh, the emergency service, uh, the dispatcher, you can use their application, and you can uh, use it in your own language, and the call taker will see it uh, in their language, so uh, it shouldn't be a, a problem. Um, I can I can give you several examples when a Hungarian guy just went for a hiking uh, to the Australian mountains and um, had some issues uh, with with their uh, with his ankle and uh, would like to call an ambulance and he uh, didn't speak uh, the German language so he just uh, pressed the button in the Hungarian application and it naturally goes through to the uh, to the emergency service in in Austria. So if we if we can use that, uh, it was very easy for us. Uh, to think about how we can interconnect all these applications and also the background of these applications, which is the AAD uh, mapping. So uh, let me uh, uh, show you some hints about the Hungarian National Ambulance Service. My name is Gabor Chato. I'm the CEO of the Ambulance Service in Hungary. The good thing is that in Hungary we have just one ambulance service for the whole country. That's a nationwide service. Uh, we will celebrate our 75th birthday in, in this year. Uh, now we have roughly 10,000 employees, uh, so we are the biggest healthcare company in, in the country. We use uh, unified protocols. 
each unit has the same equipment, uh, the same knowledge, and everything is the same all over in the country, which is a very big uh, patient safety uh, result, uh, what I believe in. Uh, we have uh, 256 ambulance stations all over in the country and seven helicopter uh, bases. And also, a couple of years ago, uh, we made an application with our partners, which is called Heart City. So uh, connecting to, to the previous presentation, we tried to involve the public to their, to their care, to their health. So uh, if you download this application and you, you have never ever seen any BLS course or anything, but you are tend to or, or you are keen to help to somebody, and in a f if you have any cardiac arrest or collapse or any major case in your 500 meter circle around you, uh, our dispatch center will send you an alert message on your phone to go there and start to help um, uh, on that patient. And for sure, we implement the AED database to this, um, to this application. So it was very easy for us to connect this database to the Lifesaver application, to the NGSOS uh, family. So now we are connected uh, with the Austrian and with the Czech application. So if you travel around these countries uh, and you downloaded this application, you can easily call uh, the nearest ambulance um, uh, unit for you. And also you can see what is the nearest um, AED uh, to your location. For sure, the application uses your geodata. Uh, it knows your exact location and also knows your uh, previous uh, medical history if you implemented it. So it's very easy uh, for our call takers to know more about you from the scene. And if you can speak or if you have any pathology on your throat or whatever, uh, you, can, you can text uh, to our, uh, our dispatcher and also you can uh, easily pick uh, your case uh, from, from pictograms. Uh, and now uh, we are really open uh, for other countries and for others to join us and to, to merge our uh, AD map data to, to yours. And now let me uh, transfer the, uh, the presentation to, to my colleague Sofia from Austria. Uh, she will show you how they do it in their country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabor. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nordhof Niederösterreich. In Austria, we have different emergency numbers. For the medical emergency, you have to dial 144. Um, the company that I work for, Nordhof Niederösterreich, dispatches an area of a popula population of 1.7 million people. We dispatch 219 uh, EMS stations and 897 vehicles. And in 2022, we received 2.2 million calls. We also very big on cross-border projects. We do have a cross-border project with Slovakia, which is called Bridges for Birth. We have an interface with the Czech Republic to make it easier when there's a call around the border to help each other with vehicles that we can use a vehicle from the Czech Republic <laughs> or they can use a vehicle from Austria. And we're currently supporting the planning of state contracts to design a framework agreement um, for cross-border rescue services with Hungary and Slovakia. In 2022, we have had 939 emergency calls through this app that Gabor just showed you. Nearly 100 of those were from the same app downloaded abroad, so from the Hungarian version, Slovakian or Czech version. Um, 65 emergency calls through an emergency app for deaf people that we have in Austria. The AD database that we use is called DefiNetzwerk. Some of you that have been here in years prior probably have heard about it because it's been presented twice before at the INA um, Congress. It is reachable online through a website by anyone. Um, we use it uh, in our dispatching, so the call taker will actually explain to the caller where the nearest, nearest AED is and how they can reach it. Um, we also use it in other emergency control and command centers. In first aid courses, we teach the, the public how to access it. And our ambulance stations, they also try to use it and update it. So the Rettungs app, which is the German version of the app, accesses our DP netzwerk and then shows the user where they can find the nearest defibrillator. When you click on it, it will also show you information that we might have on the website, such as opening times, which has been discussed before, if a defibrillator is in a bank. It's not going to be open to the public the whole day, so it's going to be open from 9 to 5 p.m., and it will say that to the people. 
through interconnecting the databases, we have been able to show the defibrillators, even if you're in the Czech version of the app, you can switch it in the future update. And even if you're not actually in Austria, you can check on your map where the defibrillators in Austria. If I'm about to go on a trip somewhere, I can check ahead and see where the nearest defibrillators might be. So this is what, we'll, what it will look like on the different platforms for the users. So they will see the different AEDs that are available, the opening times, and especially in our platform, I don't know about the Hungarian version, but in, on Defi Network, we even provide pictures. So when you know the defibrillators in the bank is behind ATM number two, we will have that with pictures and a little information. Go in, turn left, and behind the second ATM, you will find it with, with the pictures. And through the app, through interconnecting it, they will all be able to use this. So they will first use the app, to call an ambulance, and then they can go to AD and find the nearest AD and send someone to get it. The important thing, because right now we're four countries that are doing this, Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, is that you join us and that your country also provides us the information that we need so that we can make this bigger and we can roll it out to the public everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, it's not a question, it's a dream. Um, and, and thank you for mentioning it, because we're listening about uh, AD mapping, but we're also listening about the shortcomings of, of AD mapping and also of applications. So what comments would you have to say if instead of having to map the AEDs, the AEDs themselves could map themselves and give two signals, I'm here and I'm functioning. Wouldn't that be the solution? I would like to hear your comments because we, if we agree on that, then we all have to work towards that dream. And we have to convince uh, companies that are producing AEDs that we shouldn't have to map them. The AEDs themselves should map themselves and say we're functioning. We already have that I know we have at least one company that connects uh, the AEDs with Wi-Fi. Therefore, it becomes even closer to towards that goal. So I would like to have your opinions on that. I, th I think that's a great idea. And I think that should really be a push on the, on the companies that provide us with the ADs. And I know that they already have it. Not vendor agnostic, though. Philips has got one. Sol has got another one. Everyone's got one. We need to tie it together. Tie the knot tighter. Uh, in Switzerland, we approached the government, national government, to make the company, it should be required to have that. Well, the problem that the government doesn't want to intervene in a private business, first problem. Second problem is uh, probably, I'm not a specialist, it's the batteries. If you want to have the ADs located, it needs some energy, so it's more complicated and costly for owners to provide energy. Maybe it needs a power a supply or, or whatever. That's maybe a, a break for, for the customers. But that's a two, two issue I see. Otherwise, of course, that would be perfect. Another question at the back. Yeah, uh, and, and also that, that's something to address in general when it comes to AD mapping, that we just look at the two-dimensional two plan today. Nobody knows how high up the AD is. If not writing it, this one is on the third floor. Otherwise, it looks like it's on the ground floor, which I really think it should be, because well, that, that's an easy way to pick it up and everyone knows where it is. And you don't need an AD on each, each floor, actually. And uh, I actually rem remembered one thing. We've gathered now in, in, the, in the capital of, of Ljubljana. Uh, do you know where the nearest AD is now? 
It's hidden behind the uh, the first uh, stand out here. It's hidden. It's built in now, and uh, that's but another thing that you actually can bring home and and you as well, Ina. Inform your visitors about where the nearest aid is. This is the the emergency exit. This is the fire extinguisher. This is the AD. We need to make them possible to use, actually. Thank you very much, everyone. We did talk about these same subjects several years ago. I believe in this same venue, correct me if I'm wrong, where we looked at the manufacturers being able to track them, so them being able to be made that little bit more portable. You know, over the years, my phone has got sm bigger, my AED has got smaller, and this is not the smallest AED on the market at the moment. If you haven't seen this one, and this does include some of that, te that technology, and that it will tell the manufacturer it's been used so it can be replaced. These are some of the things we put on our wish list, which is actually still on the ENA website from previous conferences. It's a slow journey. We are getting there. And I'd ask you please to join me in thanking our colleagues who have presented this morning. Uh, our next steps for next year, perhaps. Ladies, gentlemen, thank you very much.